Center. Welcome to the center. Sorry. No, no worries. Welcome to the center. I'm Dr. Gil Barndoller, Director of Middle East Studies here at the center. Uh, for today's discussion of social media and information warfare in the Middle East, we have Dr. Nikki Akavan. She's an associate professor at the Catholic University of America, chair of the Media Studies Department. She's the author of Electronic Iran, The Cultural Politics of an Online Revolution. Dr. Khaled al Jabber, to my right, is director of the MENA Institute in Washington and a visiting assistant professor at Qatar University and Northwestern University in Doha. He is the former editor-in-chief of the Peninsula, Qatar's leading English language daily newspaper. Then, Dr. Akhavan. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming, and um, I just found out a few minutes before uh, that we're going to be Facebook living the event, and so I'll try to play to Facebook, but also to everybody at the at table as well. Um, whenever I uh, speak about Iranian media uh, or cultural uh, policies, um, I think it's always useful to note that um, from the inception of the Islamic Republic of Iran, it's always had this very contradictory um, position uh, in relation to established media and in relation to emerging media. Um, it's always concer uh, expressed concern from the outset that these media can be used um, as a form of cultural invasion from ab abroad, from uh, Iran's enemies, um, and that hostile information can get out there via these new and emerging uh, media forms. But it's always also recognized the power of uh, media to push forth its own agenda. And so from the outset, you see this dual uh, strategy in terms of its media policies, uh, this two-pronged strategy, where on the one hand, there's the repressive policies, everybody's very familiar with those, um, using media for surveillance, repressing the flow of information, uh, banning certain forms of media, and at the same time, using these same media forms uh, to produce content that's, that's friendly to them and to their domestic and their foreign agendas. Um, now, although this contradiction has long existed, it only became manifest uh, with the rise of the internet and with social media in particular. So let's say in the 90s, when satellite technology was a new form of technology and the government was carrying out raids on, actual, on houses, taking away people's uh, satellite dishes, you could suspect that I bet that person, the, the same authorities who are banning the technology are enjoying satellite uh, TV at home but there was no way that you could actually prove that. And so with the rise of the internet and with social media, it's there for everybody to see. You actually see the same authorities, the same people who are pro-state and pro-state policies using the media that they've banned. So Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and um, they're probably using it with internet speeds that are faster than everybody else because internet speeds are artificially kept low in Iran. So, um, and I think they recognize this contradiction and part of uh, the recognition of this contradiction is that every once in a while there's talk of having native technology. So having an Iranian internet, that's essentially an intranet, a, a national internet, or having native apps, uh, Iranian native applications to uh, rival the popular messenger services that, that are out there. So the most late, recent one was an app called um, Surush, and uh, that didn't go very well. Just five days ago, a uh, farce news agency, an Eastland news agency, they very quietly came back on uh, Telegram, which is a very, very popular messenger service, when in fact they've been a big show of leaving Telegram because it was, uh, you know, they thought that they were being uh, watched on, on Telegram, that was a propaganda tool. Um, and so the point is that at the end of it, they usually come back to the same technologies the rest of the world is using. And um, that then raises the question, well, that indicates that the, they're coming back to it because it's benefiting them in some ways. And so then the question is, what is that benefit? What are they getting out of being on these uh, media forums and sort of openly contradicting their own policies? Um, so for the purposes of the theme of uh, uh, today's discussion, um, I'm going to talk about that benefit in terms of um, what social media allows the Iranian state and sort of uh, those who are friendly to the Iranian state's uh, domestic policies 
to achieve in relation to regional uh, rivalries and in terms of the uh, current conflicts in the region. And I'm going to show this by briefly talking about um, its social media approach in the case of Syria and in the case of Yemen. Specifically, I'm going to argue that in the case of Syria, it's used social media to some extent effectively um, to frame its intervention in Syria as a defensive act and uh, a defensive act that uh, protecting Shia um, sites against extremists and also defending against those same extremists eventually making it to the Iranian homeland. Um, in the case of the war in Yemen, the social messaging is very different. There's no Iranian role acknowledged. Um, the focus is actually on the Saudi role and the Emirati role, more so the Saudi role, in bringing about a great humanitarian um, crisis. Um, and while these are very different in content, uh, they both share an emphasis on uh, the visual. The messaging is almost always very short commentary paired with visual and audio visual. Um, and that explains the popularity of Instagram in both cases although Twitter is also a popular site for this. So I'm gonna start talking um, about Syria, and I'll shortly refer you to this um, handout that um, Gil kindly made. Um, if you look at the landscape, social media landscape on Syria today, you would never know that um, for a good while after the Syria conflict began, uh, the Iranian state denied any involvement at all. So there was a total radio silence, and this radio silence was also reflected on the social media sites. Um, now, why the Iranians decided to go from silence to all of a sudden going from zero to full force on social media, um, that requires a different analysis and something I can't do for you here. But whatever those calculations consisted of, it's clear that social media platforms were central to this coming out for the Iranian state regarding its presence in Syria and it was key to its crafting its message um, regarding that involvement. Um, and the core of that message, as I already indicated, is that, okay, there's ISIS and other religious extremists and terrorists that have gained a foothold in Syria and Iraq, mostly Syria, and they're a danger to Shia holy sites, they're a danger to the Iranian way of life um, and national security threat. I mean, this is a very, um, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a familiar argument, I think, to us here in the US. We have to go fight them there so they don't fight us here. That's the same kind of argument that's being used in the case of Iran. Um, and <clears throat> so once they, the state becomes open about its involvement, you see a social media explosion that I've categorized in um, three, uh, three, three, three main categories for you. Um, the first one is, um, accounts that show their extremely, extremely violent images of ISIS and other uh, terrorists who are either carrying out violent acts or are dead. Um, I have one image for you as an example of that. This is the very first image. I really picked the one that's the least um, offensive uh, in terms of um, violence. It's somebody that they claim is a dead uh, ISIS fighter and the claim is that uh, this was an ISIS fighter who dressed as a woman and he was trying to run away in, you know, in the dress of a woman. There's some interesting subtext there, which um, maybe we can talk about during the discussion, but that is the first category of the kinds of um, Syria messaging to kind of show the violence of the ISIS and other uh, terrorist fighters. Um, the second uh, category is content that uh, pertains to martyrs that were, that were killed in uh, Syria fighting ISIS. So these would be Iranians, Afghans, um, mostly Iranians, Afghans. Um, and they show them both in Syria, but what's really interesting is you don't usually see pictures of these folks or fighters in Syria, Iranian fighters in Syria, until, they're do until they've you know, um, been killed. Um, and then once they've been killed, you see images of them on the battlefield. There'll be images of them um, their bodies being carried, you know, uh, the funerals at home, the sort of banners. Um, and I've picked, as an example of that category, I've picked the case of the most, one of the most famous people to have been killed in, um, in the Syria conflict is uh, a man named Mohsen uh, Hojaji, who's in this first 
I guess these are not numbered, but the second image, um, you can see the, the ISIS fighter behind him has been blurred out. Um, this image in various permutations was passed around thousands and thousands of, um, of times. This is, this is a screen capture of a video um, where the man you see in the foreground uh, was then beheaded and, and that video also was um, circulated. So the next two images are, are the same, are about, um, about him. The second one is him on the battlefield um, in Syria. And as I said, you tend not to see the pictures of Iranian fighters in the battlefield until they've already um, been killed. And then the last image from this category is uh, his child and his wife and the, the poster you see next to her in the image. It's one of, it's one of the banners they make when, um, yeah, the, the quote unquote, the martyrdom banner. So that's a sort of second category. You see a lot of these um, circulating. Um, and then the last category of uh, the kind of content that's produced about Syria is um, are things that are highly stylized, professional-looking productions that belong to the official accounts of commanders or come out of the official news agencies. So the most famous of these is that of um, the well-known um, Commander Qasem Soleimani. So the, the, I have three images for you um, from as examples of that. Um, he's usually shown, he's actually shown on the battlefield in Syria and usually they um, they release these pictures at very you know, strategic points when there's been, a, there's been a battle or there's something, some kind of incursion over a border or some recent uh, victory and even defeats. So it's kind of, he goes and shows his face. So um, that's the first two images. Um, both of them are in uh, Syria. There's also images in Iraq. And the last one is another category of um, images associated with him, which is him in his uh, military gear, usually very, um, uh, he's in some kind of patriotic pose. Here you see the, the flag in the background and you see the tagline anti-terrorism. A lot of his um, social media output is tagged with anti-terrorism. To, to remind the audience, and the fact that it's in English shows that they're also going for a broader audience, that rem remember, we're fighting the terrorists. We are not, we are not the terrorists. Um, now, while this is uh, very clearly set up to make that argument, that the enemy is ISIS, we're out to fight ISIS, and we're out to fight um, extremism, I think it, it also serves another purpose, and that's to draw attention away from Bashar al-Assad and his, and his regime. Um, the subtext of this social media output is that the fight is not about Assad. It's not, but about terrorism. And while um, you see some posts where Syrian government forces appear fighting alongside Iranians, that's also framed in terms of terrorism. So this same, uh, there was a, another image, I don't have it here for you, but the, the guy who beheaded um, Hujaji, they claim to have caught him and there was a lot of uh, screen caps and pictures of that where there were Syrian forces. But it, it was, again, it, there's no, uh, Bashar al-Assad is invisible in this, um, in this picture. Um, I'm actually gonna return to this point about Assad a little bit later when I talk about Yemen. Um, but I wanna bring your attention to one other important feature of the social media landscape on Syria. Um, and that's the way in which these, this output, the social media output, mirrors these, uh, the media output on the Iran-Iraq war and how the Iran-Iraq war has been memorialized for 30 years plus. So for anybody who's familiar with that war, you can see that they're trying to invoke the spirit and aura of that war in these images because that was a war where it it was a unifying war it remains a unifying point and so there is this kind of attempt to make that parallels between what iran did in the face of iraqi aggression um, as compared to what iran is doing in the face of isis's um, aggression and then, okay, so the last thing I'll, I'll say about the Syria, Syria case, and this is a really important point as well, is not about the content, but who's producing it. Um, the, it's very clear that the 
folks who are producing this, they're not just IRA officials and state supporters, but they all come from the more hardline end of the political spectrum. Um, and this is gonna be very different than what we'll see in, in Yemen. So it's a smaller, um, a narrower uh, slice of the political spectrum that's involved in this. Um, okay, so I think I will, I'm not, I have no idea what the time is looking You're like. Fine. Okay, so then I'm going to talk about Yemen um, now, uh, where the situation is a lot different for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, Iran is much more tight-lipped about any kind of involvement. Um, this recalls the early stance on Syria. Um, with Yemen, the approach is to focus on the humanitarian crisis and to repeatedly, in so doing, uh, draw attention to the role of Saudi Arabia and the role of U.S. bought weapons and, of course, U.S. Um, support in creating the crisis. Um, as in the case of Syria, the most, social or, the most popular platforms are uh, uh, Twitter and Instagram because they're very well suited for this kind of messaging. You get the visual shock of starving or wounded children paired with brief figures, um, which tend to be either like dollar figures that have been spent on US weapons or the number of children um, killed. So it's very compelling uh, messaging. However, unlike the social media messaging around Syria, uh, which invokes the language of martyrdom and sacred defense, reminiscent of the Iran-Iraq war, um, the messaging around Yemen is intended to be more universal. Uh, so it's, the themes are not religious themes. I mean, people will invoke religious, uh, you know, they'll invoke God or, or certain prophets or whatnot, but um, the messaging is, is universal. It's more in terms of language of human rights, even if it is to sort of question human rights regime uh, worldwide. It's about themes of injustice. So it's about, oh, look at this, this poorest country in the Middle East being um, bombarded by the richest countries in the region with the um, support of the most powerful country in the region and who's paying for it, it's, it's innocent um, civilians. So unlike the images from Syria where you see milit militarized images of both sides, so you see ISIS and the religious fighters and then you also see the Iranians and you see the Syrian forces, um, from the, yep, when you look at the posts on Yemen, there's almost never any, any fighters. Every once in a while you'll see like, oh, here's an image of a fighter and it's you know, long shots. There's not that sort of close up identification with any kind of military power. It's women and children, women and children, or you know, fathers holding their children, a, a lot of that on, on repeat. So it's a variation of that. And I, um, I have actually three, three slides to show this. The order of my slides are, well, they were originally slides, um, are not exactly where I um, wanted them to be, but you can see from uh, the first slide on Yemen, I mean, they get, um, they get, it's hard to look at them, of course, but as I said, they're kind of variations of the same. This first one, the image of, as you can see, um, wounded and killed children, and the, the tagline is, um, this is how um, Saudi Arabia caresses the children of, of Yemen. Um, that's the first line of it. The second one, um, uh, this is the one where the father is holding a little girl who's um, <coughs> holding her head. Um, this one is an interesting one because it cites the familiar numbers. You always get uh, taglines about how much money is being sent, spent by the Saudis on the conflict. But this one also talks about how, I mean, this figure is, I have no idea if it's right, I'm sure it's not, but they, they claim that there's 25% of the Saudi population that's uh, you know, in poverty and look at all this money that Saudi Arabia is spending on Yemen when they could be helping their own people. The only reason I find this particularly noteworthy is because this is a long-standing argument that's been used against Iran. Now look at the Iranian economic situation, look at how much the Iranians are suffering, they're spending all their money in Lebanon, they're spending all their money on Palestinians. So, you know, they're, they're just using that same um, argument in the case of uh, Saudi Arabia. And, and they do so in, in, when they talk about the U.S. as well. So it's interesting to see that, um, that sort of information war uh, paralleling one another. Um, okay, so the, 
there's the other one, uh, again, more of the same, but it has the English content. So uh, the first line in Persian, is Yemen, the land of blood and bombs, the land of uh, defenseless children, the um, without a sound, without any anybody to, to help them. And then you can see the messages also in English. They're going for a broader audience, um, as I already as I already mentioned. Now there's, okay, so the, the next slide, well, the very last slide is more of the same. I, I will just um, skip it. But once again, bringing up Saudi Arabia and um, the US. So as you can see, there's nothing about Iranian involvement, uh, Iranian um, funds, Iranian presence. There's no um, Qasem Soleimani, although there has been, but the, mo most of the output, it looks like this. Um, so before going to the, the last slide that I want to talk about in terms of Yemen, um, I wanted to pause and reflect on the, the issue of how Iran's social media activities in Syria are different from Yemen um, in terms of uh, what I mentioned earlier about Bashar al-Assad. Um, if you look at the Iranian internet very generally, you see that there is, of course, opposition to Bashar al-Assad. Um, and there is a, the Assad factor, I think, and the crimes he's committed, um, that it's my sense that that's what prevents ordinary Iranian users, other than the most hardline of state supporters, from taking up the government's line. So even though you sense among the users in general, worry about, you know, as much as they might be against Bashar al-Assad, they worry, okay, who are these moderate rebels? Uh, they, they worry about how moderate they are. They, they sort of agree with the Iranian government that there is a lot of extremism. They don't want to come right out and be on the Iranian side because how can you be, right? I mean, just the, the atrocities um, committed by, you know, the, the Bashar al-Assad regime are so, um, they're just so in your face. There's no way you can get around that. However, um, in the case of the Yemeni posts, like if I did an experiment, and, and in fact, I did an experiment, where if you cover, if you do a search for Yemen and you don't look at the profile, so you try, you, you don't look at, okay, this is a hard line, and you don't guess from the profile who they may be, the accounts, the sort of, the argument about Yemen is the same across the political spectrum. So there, the ordinary users, the people who are even oppositional will, will, will talk about the same, the, the framing is the same. Look at what's happening in Yemen. These people, children are starving. Look at what Saudi Arabia is doing. Look at what the money that, you know, the, the um, the guns, that, uh, the bombs that are being sold to them. And so in this sense, the Iranian state's message is magnified because um, people are saying the same things they're saying, even if they're not identifying with the Iranian state. And so I think that's part, partly why the Iranian state doesn't uh, sort of even talk about its own involvement because that might muddy the waters and it might prevent its message from um, being magnified. Um, Okay, so, and this kind of synergy actually, you can see it uh, in the case, in the recent case of the, um, the Khashoggi uh, murder, because there is this, un again, there's this unintended synergy in messaging. And that's why I wanted to save the last slide, um, well, it's not the next to the last slide, because it's the one where you have um, the image Yemen and blood and um, fire. Uh, so the person is claiming um, we live in a world where the, the murder of one person, of one journalist, is more important than the, the mass murder of Yemeni children and, and women and children. And then, of course, you know, blaming uh, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and, and, um, for what's happening in Yemen. But you can see how they're kind of having it always. You know, there's this, they get to condemn Yemen, they get to talk about the Khashoggi murder, but they also get to have a moral kind of high ground. Like, we're not making a big deal about this murder. It's everybody else that's making a big deal. We see the bigger uh, picture. So I thought that was an interesting kind of um, result of some of uh, the most recent um, discussions. Okay, I think I'm, it's a time for me to conclude maybe. Um, uh, I'll, I'm gonna conclude by going back to the question that I raised in my opening, which is why would Iranian officials and hardline supporters be so openly and active present on the social on the same social media platforms when these are the same platforms that they ban, filter, and, and critique. 
And I hope that my description of their social media approach to the Syria and Yemen crisis has answered this question, which briefly put is that they are able to um, shape and spread messaging that reaches a broader audience and that may find sympathy for a broader audience, even if that broader audience is an anti-Islamic Republic of Iran uh, uh, broader audience. Um, and that's, that's where I'll end, I guess. Thank you, Nick. Khaled? <clears throat> Thank you, Gail. Thank you for inviting me actually today to talk about a very important subject. Maybe Dr. Nicky talk, uh, talk about uh, perspective that uh, consider Iran with uh, Middle East. For me, maybe uh, I would like to see a bigger pictures. I believe social media, I don't know how many people uh, here read about the Arabian Nights, maybe some of you or maybe all of you, but I believe the social media when it starts is about Arabian Night, but it's, it's end up as Arabian Night here. Especially what would we see now with what happened with Jamal Khashoggi. And Jamal Khashoggi is a case. Case, it's a lot of people suffer from that too, and we'll talk about it. We have time now for even the questions. When the social media started it, everyone has a hope. Why, why is, is it a hope, especially in the Arab world? Because we look to the media today mass communication, political communication, and Arab world from the Middle East to North Africa. This has been controlled by the government in every single aspect. Television, radio, newspaper. So when the social media came, it was a different platform. The government cannot tightly control it the way that they do with other social, with other media, that in their hand. And I think the turning point, when it comes to the Arab Spring, when the audiences start to using this social media tools and platform <coughs> as a political weapon, to mobilize, to criticize the government, and we already followed the story. It started from Tunisia with Bazizi and the guys burn himself, uh, protesting as a young person, just graduated, and he has no job, no life, and even he cannot sell on the street because the government they want him to do that. And how that flame goes from the country to the other, to Egypt, to Libya. And to reach also the, the Gulf region. The Gulf region is the most <coughs> you know, richest country in the Arab world, but they started to see even that revolution is not far away from them when it's come to Yemen and start and change the regime. They start asking, how can we deal with this? social media, how can we deal with this monsters? We cannot control it, we cannot guide it. So they come with a different idea and that's what we call it in our board as a counter revolution. So the social media used to counter revolution, it started with the social media, now they use it as a weapon to to counter it and destroy the way that it's been function. This becomes so obvious, particularly in 2014 and post that. Why 2014? 2014 we, we used to see the, a lot of troll armies be coming from nowhere. We just, we tweet, just, any, any of us start tweeting and maybe you say something is not agreed with the government and you see a lot of people come and they criticize you. 
Where did they come from? This is the first question. Who are they? What, what they want? How can these people come and create a hashtag and criticize you? Until we figured it out when the Gulf crisis started, and that's what we focus in our studies, in the book that we published uh, a month ago, to see how this army has been functioning to attack others did not agree with the government. And in that case, is not agree with the blockade countries. And the blockade countries in that case was like three Gulf countries, Saudis, Emiratis, and Bahrainis. And they use every single thing it's possible to attack you, to destroy you, to kill you in the virtual life and they kept you apart. That's what we see now in, in the Jamal Khashoggi case. The problem with the, with the social media uh, now, it's the government invests a lot of billions. They established sort of organization inside the region and outside the region and they hire hundreds of youth and experts and their job what the ministry or what a person in that ministry tell them what to do give them the order attack this person, start this hashtag, uh, disagree with this countries, and so on and so forth. They succeeded at what we read also in the New York Times, maybe the last article that has been published uh, like a month and a half ago, where they succeeded to ban some people and put them in the, in the social media platform. There's some spy walking on Twitter. And also on other uh, media platform. And these spies help to get username, to get email, to get information and send it to the authorization regimes in the Middle East. And that case was the, the New York Times article talk about the Saudi guy who was in the Twitter and be, become in the highest position. And that let him get access to a lot of information that is not allowed uh, from others. So, and he used that and, and, and give it with people that pay him in his country and that led them to search for different accounts and put them into jail. The last news two weeks ago, one of that person has been criticized the government, he's died and until now, we don't know how is the story is real or not, but in Jamal Khashoggi case, it's been obvious. The guy saw what's going on, he worked with the media, he actually summarized what we, what we talked about from the beginning. He's from the establishment. He was an editor chief for the newspaper so the change in his country, and I think he knows it better than all of us when we all of us talking about reform, and he knows exactly what's going on. So he decided to leave and come and live in Virginia, United States. And the only weapon that he had, it's a social media, just a training. 
He, I think he used Twitter. I don't think he used Facebook. I lost all my friends on Twitter. Until, you know, he's been well known here. You know, Washington Post come to him and ask him to write an article. And, you know, little by little, he became an express in his uh, perspective and, and point of view. Since he started that, they try to convince him to come back. They give him money. They try to use the other way to threaten him. And, they, and his kids push him to divorce his wife. Then it didn't work. You know, they follow him in, you know, in Turkey, and we know the, the rest of the stories. Uh, what happened to him in the counselor and still until now, day after day, we find more and more stories related to that. What I believe now with the whole of these stories, now we need really to, to fight back. This is not one person uh, issue, it's not one country. I think the whole Middle East and the Arab world is suffering. And it's time that the ministry media here, activists, analysts, to understand what's really going on there and maybe conducting more research and study to help people to express themselves, especially with this whole challenge that's going on with social media. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'll start off with a pair of questions here and then open up the floor. Uh, Nikki, could you speak a little bit about something you've been quoting for the U.S. efforts to, to kind of weaponize or, or use uh, Iranian feminist movements against the regime? Right. So, do you want to say that? Yeah, speak a little bit about that and then how successful you think that is or how that uh, co opting these, these movements uh, helps or hurts uh, the Iranian people in civil society as, as U.S. sanctions ramp up. Um, well, my personal opinion is that it hurts them, uh, it hurts movements inside the country because those are the folks who then can easily be linked to, especially in this environment, I think maybe in a, in a different moment with a different, different relationship uh, between Iran and the U.S. or a different administration, things would, uh, might not be so obviously harmful to Iranian activists, but even when um, the relationship between the U.S. and Iran looked like it might be at least going through a, uh, you know, improving somewhat. Um, we've seen time and time and again, and I have some background in uh, doing human rights work as well, is that whenever the uh, there is a statement from official sources in the U.S. Um, claiming, even if it's just claiming solidarity, even if it's a friendly statement with civil society activists, it's like a like a kiss of death for them, because then they get marked as uh, working with or hand in hand or in the interest of the U.S. And right now, the fact that you bring up um, sanctions is a really n important uh, issue that there is a divide along that again. And um, there are those who are, who are saying, well, it's the Iranian government's fault that the sanctions are in place. And those who say, no, it's actually, well, there was a there was an agreement and the U.S. violated it, this agreement, etc. And you can see that, that there's, a, there's an inside-outside divide. That's not to say that there aren't people inside Iran who, uh, who side with diaspora voices, but most activists on the ground recognize that um, when their messaging gets echoed by people like Pompeo, then they're, then they're in trouble. Um, whether it, that may not be fair, but that's the way it is, and that's the way that the authorities use those statements um, against them. So I think that's one of the catch 22s of being online, using social media, because you can get your message out there, but then it's easy for somebody to co opt and, uh, that same messaging and then inadvertently place you in a, in a between the rock and hard place, essentially. Thank you. And Khaled, uh, you probably saw it yesterday when the U.S. announced the Magnitsky Act sanctions against 17 Saudi figures. Saud al Qatani, who's, who's appeared to be a close advisor of, of the Crown Prince, uh, he was one of the most prominent people on that list, probably the most prominent. 
he's directed Saudi social media and especially kind of uh, in line with the GCC crisis efforts against uh, Qatar in the past. How much do you think these these efforts depend on key figures in proximity to the uh, to centers of power, and how much of this is, is as you said, to some extent, um, pretty widespread, pretty well-run networks of, of messaging and, and propaganda and counter-revolution? It's funny. I just uh, turned on uh, Twitter and I found a report that said he's still an actor. Mm -hmm. But he's doing it in secretly, so that means he's not mm -hmm. even under investigation. So I, I don't think it's just only one person is doing that. I think it's the whole uh, armies uh, behind it, and they're taking an order from the highest level uh, in the government. You know the problem now. That social media has become the government, to, the government's uh, tool, uh, not just in the Middle East. I was reading a report yesterday about how the government using uh, social media to, to favor it for th their uh, opinion and perspective in, in, in China and in, in Russia, uh, in <coughs> Europe. Even the states here, but definitely Middle East is, is, is the worst. It's the worst case because the whole mess is going on since Arab Spring until now. I think the only hope that audiences have that to express themselves or ask for reform uh, now is gone. Or at least it's not the way that it's been that, that the way that it started. This year something happened to them. Uh, and now with the government investing all this uh, effort and, and money, it's easily they can get uh, get to them and uh, you know get revenge of them and, and get very uh, worse scenario the way that happened with Jamal Khashoggi. Unfortunately, the, the government effort, uh, it's not converted with other, with other effort from the social, social media platform or even from organization that understand what social media uh, all about. Thanks. Questions? I'll, I'll ask one. Uh, Paul Saunders, the executive director of the center, then, and thank you very much uh, to both of you for coming to speak. I think it, it's been really fascinating. Uh, I guess I, I'm totally uninformed on on the issue of social media, and uh, I'm an expert on Russia, not the Middle East. So this is a, a, a question from somebody who really knows nothing. Uh, you know, as you look kind of broadly at the region. Uh, which governments do you think are uh, uh, perhaps most effective uh, or, uh, and making the greatest uh, investments uh, in, in trying to use uh, social media and, and which may be lagging behind? Uh. Well, I, I'm not a comparativist, so mm -hmm. I don't, I don't really, I can't really answer yeah. that question. I certainly know that the Iranian government has put a lot of resources mm -hmm. into producing, you know, the the troll armies and, and getting its messaging out there. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to capture the impact, you know, in sort of quantitative terms. Sure. But I would, I think that their investment has paid off to some extent at least in the case of Syria. I think they were effective in muddying the waters early on in terms of the conflict, and I think it caused a lot of confusion um, very early on. I mean, I don't know how reflective it was of the on-the-ground situation, but you know, the Arab Spring, Iranians were very supportive of every single Arab Spring uprising, including in Syria. And then there was a silence, because I think this messaging started to get out that, oh my God, look at who the opposition is to Bashar al-Assad. So I think that um, in that sense, they've been effective. On the other hand, Iran has a very sophisticated op opposite, well, 
they have a very, I, I don't want to say they have a sophisticated opposition, that's not true of the opposition in, in the US, but you know, the, um, there's a lot of media savvy folks who are in opposition to uh, the Iranian government. And so there are entire groups of people working individually or with organizations who are out to expose the trolls. And so they, it's, it's, a, it's an online battle. And so I think while they've put a lot of money and they've been effective, there's a lot of Iranians countering that message as well. So. I can add to that, uh, if we go back again to the Arab Spring, I can you, you can see how the, the news media play a big role in that. Particularly Al Jazeera. We disagree with Al Jazeera with a lot of uh, uh, broadcasting and, and issues, but Al Jazeera play a big role starting from Tunisia to, to Egypt to Libya and to Yemen. And I think this has scared the government, particularly the Gulf government. <coughs> when the revolution started to come to Yemen, people asking to reform in Bahrain, Oman, Shia asked you know, reform in, in Saudi Arabia and the South, and also in, in, in Imad as well, the, the scholars and the, some academic who wrote the, the letter to the ruler and they put them all in the, in the prison right now. So I think since that until now, they believe they cannot compete with a news media. Al Jazeera, BBC, uh, France 24, even the, when they start their own uh, media out there, like Al Arabi and uh, Sky, did not, it's not been affected the way that the other uh, news media, which the freedom have, it's not affected that them. So, I think they invest a lot of billion of dollars, especially in Saudis and Emiratis and the social media, creating the, the armies, war armies, buying the spying uh, programs. And they thought this is the only, I mean, it's the big battle they should be there and uh, succeeded to send their message and a perspective to their own people and to the rest of the world. So they invested from now, from there until now billion and billion of dollars and they continue to do so. Thanks. Other questions? Kelly? Yeah, I was wondering if um, either you could speak to regime or, or allied groups targeting uh, people in the West. And, and I'm actually, I'm a little curious about this personally. I, uh, I cover Iran a fair amount and I, I cover a lot of opposition groups. And I got some strange emails a couple months ago. Um, very specific, um, uh, saying, you know, aren't you worried about covering some of these groups? Aren't you worried you're not gonna get a promotion if you do? Aren't you worried about your reputation? And, the name that it came from was just like a generic American name, and I Googled nothing, you know. Um, so I, I actually don't know where th these emails came from, but it seems to me that it seems likely it had something to do with either the regime or regime allied people. And I've, I haven't heard a lot about this sort of thing. You know, we've, we've seen, of course, that Facebook and Twitter have shut down lots of accounts that, you know, were, were um, you know, run by the Iranian regime. And so I'm just curious if you've, if you've heard anything about this and, and is this something that they're also doing? About the targeting of individuals? And, well, and individuals in the West. I know, you know a lot of the yeah. focus here has been sort of messaging, right. um, but. They certainly keep track of what's going on and who's saying what. Um, so I think that, I'm mean, gonna be very curious about the emails that you yeah. received and what they were in response to. But they, um, they are, they, they know what's going on in the think tanks here. I'm a little nervous about today, actually. Oh. Being on. But yes, they, they. Well, I should mention, sorry, my affiliation. I'm Kelly Torrance. I'm at the Weekly Standard, so okay. I'm a journalist. Okay. Yeah. So I think that they, and and it becomes very sensitive. You know, like somebody, um, they they try to connect the dots. And so I wouldn't be, I would be surprised if they went after someone like you. I don't really know. But yeah. No, I was surprised I would, too. But I. 
I wouldn't be surprised if you're on their radar though, because they do keep track of who writes what. And of course there's all the whole conspiracy theory contingent, which is just the internet in, in general. Um, but um, I wouldn't uh, dismiss that. I know that, uh, for example, um, the FDD, one of the think tanks here, they, they follow what they do. And, and that's one of the cases where you see the magnification of the Iranian, sort of the, the regime messaging the same as oppositional messaging because mm -hmm because there are oppositional groups that don't like FTT and what its role it's played in American uh, discourses around Iran. So I, I would say that they, they are keeping track. They, they are interested and there is a, I don't know if you'd call it a troll army, but they're certainly, they're certainly aware. What was the, uh... I'm not familiar with that on the subject. <laughs> well, well, I guess I'm kind of curious, and this links a little bit to Kelly's uh, question. I mean, in the, the uh, case of Iran, and actually also in the case of Saudi Arabia, uh, how, how would you estimate kind of the division in their focus between you know, domestically oriented uh, political uh, messaging, you know, focused on their own uh, uh, kind of political environment and legitimacy and stability and all of those other issues uh, versus uh, internationally oriented uh, messaging that's looking for uh, 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 sympathy or, or kind of trying to, to magnify uh, uh, Iran's or the Saudi uh, voice. You know, on, on international issues? Um, I would say in the case of Iran, the domestic messaging, the state broadcaster, IRIB, it's long had problems. It's been so bad that even the hardliners recognize how bad it is in terms of programming and reaching the population. And now they have um, they have satellite rivals from BBC, uh, BBC and this other channel called Manotor, the most popular satellite TV. So they, I, I feel like they, they work on the domestic imaging, I mean the messaging, but they have also a long worked on trying to get international sympathy. So um, the satellite channel Al Alam, which was the uh, directed towards Arab language speaker, that was one of the earliest indications. Um, then there was Press TV, it used to have an office just down here. Yeah. And they were pretty good at the beginning. I mean, their content was good, and then, and then it went like, massive, like it was just prop, straight up propaganda, and then of course they were banned. So there have been multiple efforts. I, I think they they do think that they might have a more friendly audience abroad um, for people who are not living the day-to-day -day -day realities of, um, I think their activities outside would be more if they weren't facing sanctions and the shutdown of their uh, satellite and other you know, I think there's always uh, two messages, one for domestic and more, one for international. And if you remember, when the reform vocabulary started three years ago, it's been invested with a lot of billion here in Washington, D.C., buying writers, paying a lot of millions for think tank. So this does not come from the sky. It's been shaped for the, the years, but when we talk about the women allowed to drive, this is a message for the international. See the other message for the local or domestic. You see the women who been, who drive, who dare to drive first as an activist, they are in jail now. Not just the women. Everyone dare to speak or give a different perspective that disagree with the government is in the present. So this kind of game to tell you when they sit with the Western uh, you know, scholars, academics, politicians, and tell them something about democracy, human rights, but in reality, none of this has been there. And this hypocrisy, it's been buying, fortunately, from the other organization. We, you know, we understand the politician have their own reason, but the media buy it, think tank, <coughs> activist, and they, they, they really uh, try to promote it. It's, it's for me, it's a shame.
and now a lot of people suffering from that even now with Jamal Khashoggi crisis we have a moral issues should we still sell a weapon to Saudis or we believe in Western you know values and principle that no this is a human being and we have really to be look at it in the serious way the battle is there it's still there and the question is how this is going to end what then or the battle i'm curious for both of you when you're watching um iranian social media can you tell what's coming from the government or do they totally disguise it and when you were talking about um, government hiring you know, hundreds of uh, kids, college kids, um, you know, to popularize a hashtag or to make a message or to attack a person, I was aware that Russians were doing that, but are they doing that in Iran and in the Arab world? And can you, can you see the effects of it? Is it, I mean, because I still had the help that social media uh, had the possibility for real discussion, but maybe not. I think they're pretty easy to spot. I think it takes some some training to spot them. I mean, the, the there are many sites which are openly pro-government, or they're the they're you know they put their affiliations on the table. So the people with a real first name and last name who are um, you can identify who they are, and even if they're not state affiliated but pro-state, they tend to have their full names. Um, but there's a lot that you can do to kind of guess who might be uh, part of any kind of troll army, and, and also on the opposition side as well. So, so you have number... So they have a troll army? Yeah, yeah, everybody has them. <laughs> yeah, they have them. And how much do you see that affecting a, a real discourse on the internet? I mean, because 200 people is not that many. I mean, the 200 people, if they attack a journalist, okay, yeah, it's bad. Yeah. Especially if they can dig up dirt on you. But well, 200 people trying to talk about an issue when you're talking about billions. Right? That's true, except that I think it changes the the sort of sense of the like sense of communication online. And so once you have a feeling that oh, there's some trolls out there, and you start blocking people, and you start you know uh, you disengage with them, whether or not you think legitimately they're a uh, troll or not, the conversation keeps getting narrow and narrower. So mm -hmm. what I find now is that. <coughs> Even if they're not disrupting the conversation per se, people have already retreated into their own little echo chambers, just like we have in, you know, unfortunately, the way that we have offline as well. So I think in that sense, they've impacted things. But you would still at least have some freedom, right? Yes. You're not only getting your own government's news. Yes. It's, it's, it's not about the, the 100 people anymore. They're not 200, they are like hundreds. Okay. They don't know the real numbers. But these hundreds is in charge with hundreds of thousands of the accounts. Mm -hmm. So when you write something uh, criticizing, for example, the president, and you see like thousand people attacking you on your platform, the thing, the first thing you can ask yourself, who are these people? Where do they come from? Mm -hmm. Why are they attacking me? I'm just you know, the discourse is definitely is affected. <coughs> It's as affected as a result in the Middle East, in particular, as a part of the revolution. Why do you think there is no one asking about reform in Egypt, for example, or Tunisia, or, 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 or Yemen? Why is like nobody criticized the war in Yemen from Saudis and Emiratis or even from other from other Gulf yeah, countries? They control the discourse in the social media, and they push you to believe in one perspective, mm -hmm. uh, and push you to think what you what is in your mind is it's wrong, and you have you, you need to change it, or something else can happen to you. The way that has happened to Jamal Khashoggi as well. So how can we act with this? I think Twitter and Facebook should be holding accountable. They need to to see this and the serious issues. I'm scared of I'm gonna criticize the Twitter, I'm gonna close my account. Do you, <laughs> you, you, you <laughs> think they know who they are? They have their way, of course. At least they're gonna know like if they're like troller armies, not gonna know every single one. But they, they have their way. 
I, the way that I see, they just woke up. Maybe like a week or two weeks back, then they tried to clean the troll. Uh, any, any account is not active for two weeks, or they have like uh, just a little followers, they, they shut it down, something like that. But they have their way. Unfortunately, before they just look in and enjoying the scene, and they think, wow, okay. But now Twitter is like, you know, how, how many billion uh, users, we're happy, we can use this as, uh, as an ad for marketing or commercial. But now we know the story is not about that. It's just a bigger issue and they have to deal with it. I guess I'm wondering, um, we do social media fighting terrorism, but we do it from one account. And uh, so, you know, if we're doing something for good, right. should we be copying this model? <laughs> so that, <laughs> see, uh, many people are in the in the service of, of a, but what I would say is I'm I'm actually a little torn on this issue of blocking uh, yeah, uh, trolls yeah. because I think trolls first of all like we have Facebook doing it we have Twitter doing it there's no transparency we don't know what criteria they're using who they're blocking who they're not blocking so that's the one thing and as a researcher. I find the trolls useful because they let me see the direction of you know where where is the conversation being pushed and sort of trying to surmise what's going on. Now when it comes to threatening people and that sort of stuff, well that's different, you know, that's a different story. But I think we should either have all trolls or ban them all or you know at, at least have transparency. You're not going to get the social media companies to ban free speech. Oh, they have true. well so. <laughs> <laughs> Depends, depends on who. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I guess that. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna say if no one else. I mean, I wasn't gonna ask another one, but if, if no one else is, then then I will. No, I, you know, your comments about about you know the, the media and think tanks buying into to a lot of stuff is interesting. And to me, it's sort of how is there anything we can do to, you know, have a, you know, get the media to be a little more critical and thoughtful. I mean, you. You know, anytime uh, Javad Zarif or MBS do their, you know, Western media tour, you know, you, I read transcripts and I watch videos and the journalists are, they're always fawning and, you know, just like excited to be talking to someone so important. And, you know, again, you get these profiles and stories like here, are, you know, with both of them, these reformers who are, and of course, you know, later we see some of the things that they do, but you don't see as much on that. Is there anything... Is there anything we can do to try to get the media to be more critical? I think some of the engagements with, with Zarif online in English bring attention to that. So that is something we can do. Um, the Zarif case is a little sensitive because he, like currently, he's been summoned. He's under so much attack inside Iran. And, and so I think there's some hesitancy on some Iranian part to target him um, because they feel like you know, we got bigger fish to fry in terms of um, Iranian government uh, figures that are problematic. But for our part, I think responding online in English mm. and you know just sort of atting the journalists right. who are who are um, interviewing them brings some visibility. Of course, you open yourself up for all kinds of yeah. other engagement. <laughs> no, I believe we we have to challenge the media. You know, after Jamal Khashoggi, even the New York Times, the way that they cover the news in the Washington Post is totally different. Even the writers who've been embarrassed at MBS, like Thomas Friedman, uh, as an example, when he wrote, you know, the, the famous uh, article two years ago, <laughs> he wrote a couple of articles to just justify his position David Agnatius, I can go like uh, many. Uh, our role is really to challenge the media and uh, not buying the stories the way that we, we've done uh, before. And I think what comes with the Middle East is we have to ask a million questions, with every single details about different issues in politics, and economy, and the human rights, and, and activists. And, until now that we're talking much a lot of activists in the in the prison. And we focus on Jamal Khashoggi cases definitely, but there's a lot of Jamal Khashoggi cases still there. Nobody talking about it. So I think this is our role here as a think tank and, uh, and activists that 
as a user for Twitter that that you what we doing now, Kelly. <laughs> Uh, Adam Laman, National Interest. I had a question about Iran's media strategy in Syria. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, Iran frames its martyrs a lot in terms of Afghans and Iranians. Is there any overlap or any use of Hezbollah fighters from Lebanon or Pakistanis that are fighting in Syria? Um, Hezbollah for sure. Le Lebanese Hezbollah for sure. Pakistanis, I don't know about. The things that I've seen is, is primarily the Afghans. Um, first, the Afghans were living in Iran, but the, apparently there's been some recruitment in Afghanistan proper. I don't know about that. Yeah. I think you brought this up to my Yeah, there's been some yeah. Shia, the Hazar communities have yeah. been heavily recruited. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's definitely a Hezbollah Le Lebanon uh, connection. And in fact, when you know, in the slides I showed you, when they caught somebody who was involved in, in the beheading of that um, mm -hmm. of uh, Mohsen uh, Hojaji, Le uh, Lebanese Hezbollah is the one who negotiated the uh, the exchange for his body. So they they traded a bunch of ISIS fighters, got to go to I don't know where, maybe Homs, I'm not sure, and then they gave um, the body back to the Iranians. So Hezbollah definitely has a role and it's definitely, and that role was outlawed in, in the social media accounts that it was Hezbollah who negotiated that. And Don't you have a Hezbollah um, shirt on one of these pictures? Yeah, that's uh, in the back, the guy who's talking to Soleimani, yes. That's an Iranian Hezbollah, I'm not sure if it's Iranian Hezbollah, because they both have the same um, RPG or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, that's right. As a, a follow-up to that, um, yeah. do you see the Iranian social media campaign coordinating with uh, Lebanese Hezbollah or the Russian social media campaign regarding Syria? Is it kind of a trifecta or are they complementary but more distinct? You know, because I focus on, only on the Persian language mm -hmm. ones, I don't know. I would imagine that there is some, um, some overlap there, but uh, I, I don't have the data to sort of to tell you for certain. Thank you. Most of, sorry, most of your slides were, were focusing on Twitter, but of course there's the Facebook. Yes, uh, they're Instagram actually. Oh, Instagram, yeah. sorry. Yeah. So, uh, but is there a difference between the social media that uh, the government regime use? Do they use it differently per media, or is it all the same, the strategy? Um, for Instagram and uh, Twitter and even Facebook, it's it's similar because they, it's highly it's audio and audio visual a lot. I mean, I'm sorry, visual and, um, and moving images as well. Uh, they have they use Telegram, um, but their engagement on Telegram is very different because Telegram is a closed group, so you you know you buy into the groups so and you can't broadcast out, and so that tends to be much more insider talk and sort of. Uh, narrow casting, whereas this kind of stuff is supposed to be broadcasting. LinkedIn? Yeah. LinkedIn, I have not seen them on <laughs> <laughs> Telegram is really big, and a, Telegram is, a, from a researcher's point of view, very hard, because I can follow official accounts, but people have their group, you know, internal accounts, and you, you, can't, you can't just pop in there and see what's going on the same way that I can do for these um, accounts. Uh, according to the numbers, well, uh, different uh, studies. One of them uh, is Northwestern universities. They do it almost every year in the, in the Middle East and in North Africa and Arab world in particular. It showed that Twitter using as a political suppression more than others. Uh, Facebook mostly using with, with, the, with the socialization, uh, but with come with the politics and the suppressing your opinion, they're using Twitter more. That the, the way maybe that uh, most uh, the Gulf countries invested in Twitter more than others. I think Walid Muntalal has uh, some share in the Twitter. It's funny, huh? Probably. <laughs> Quite sure. John. Yeah, you talked about sort of trying to control the discourse, um, but what about, about censorship? Uh, I mean, you, you talked about the internet being unusually slow in Iran. Does that have something to do with censorship, and then you, you talked about the troll armies trying to control the, the discourse, right? And sort of comparing this to China, right, which has the Great Firewall, is very effective at censorship. Where do countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia stand as far as their censorship capabilities? Um, 
The the speeds are kept artificially low, although under Rohani, one of his big achievements was that he spiked the speed, and so everybody was so thrilled with that. <laughs> um, uh, so, but, and they do filtering, they try to ban things. Like I said, uh, it comes and goes. So Telegram was heavily filtered a few months ago because they were trying to roll out this new messenger, and they gave up. And, and you know, sometimes there are filters, but everybody uses a VPN anyway. And so you just get around it. It's a pain, but you get around it. And then there's those periods where there is, um, you know, a clampdown, and it might be more difficult to reach a certain uh, application. It's even like the, you know, with like the Uber, the Iranian Uber, which I forget what it's called. I, I want to say it's called Snap. But even for that, like the application, sometimes if you try to download the application and it sees that you have Uber, it won't let you download it. So they, they try to artificially sort of control the market, um, the marketplace of ideas as with the market. And so you definitely see that, but as I was saying in response to an earlier question, the population using is pretty sophisticated in terms of responding. Um, so they're a pain, but they're not totally effective. I think censorship is old method. The government, they don't believe it now anymore. Actually, they want to know who is tweeting. <laughs> So he can go on them and crash them and kill them with the bonsa or whatever. It's tools is available. So yeah, the method now is different with the government. They want to see who's criticizing, who has dared to speak. To, to what extent are uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia kind of focusing on countering one another's narratives or uh, attacking one another versus you know doing other things is that a major priority for them is, is there any kind of a, a social media war uh, maybe between the two of them if I could put it that way I think there is there is now there's a kind of language gap where they can't really, I mean, there is the Iranian Arabic speaking, mm -hmm. and maybe using Hezbollah's proxy, I don't actually know, that might be, Lebanese, you know, Lebanese. Um, so there is some attempts, but I think a lot of it's being done in English because there's this international, uh, because the threat by Saudi Arabia is only a threat because of Western support. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it's out. But there, it's definitely out there, and there's definitely you can see it between individual users, you can see it between government accounts. Um, and this is where the Iranian government gets some traction from ordinary users who are, who are also um, contributing to that. And I believe this is not just about Iran and Saudis. And I, I think this is the whole Middle East uh, thing. You know, the, the last uh, report come from UNESCO they found from 2016 to 2017, I, I have the figures, it's almost 1,000 journalists killed, okay? 90% of this case, it's disappeared. So the murder, or the person who did that murder is get away with this, 90%, imagine. So this is game is going on there, and this continues is going on there. <coughs> if we see the that's also a report for uh, the Freedom House. You will see none of the Arab countries is considered to be a free country, except Tunisia. And even this year, particularly, the, uh, the, the numbers like disagree. But uh, unfortunately, the freedom of speech, uh, it's, it's not there. The freedom of speech is not there. The democracy is not there. The human rights is not there. So everybody is suffering. If you are like really an, an, a, a normal person, a person try to be activist, or a person try to use a social media to tweet something in your mind that it's not goes with the government perspective. This is the whole problems and the dilemma that's going on there, and it's become a nightmare. Nathan, if I open something Adam said, uh, discussing Iranians' use of social media use of, of proxies, mm -hmm. are there any? I know you said, especially in Yemen, fighters are kept out of the picture almost entirely. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Syria, there's obviously martyrdom efforts um, and that that line of messaging. Is there any uh, any use of kind of a, a pan Shia 
message describing proxies explicitly and fighting the same fight. I know you said there's a focus on keeping the fight, the focus on countering terrorism by yeah. propping up Assad. How much are you know, the laundry list of uh, Lebanese Hezbollah, there's Palestinian fighters there, there's obviously Syrians, uh, Pakistanis, she, Afghan Shias. Mm -hmm. How much are they brought into one common narrative on social media? Um, in the Syria case, it's certainly there. Mm -hmm. um, and so you see a lot of, um, even if it's not in the original context, they play a lot, they, they put a lot of resources in, in making those connections. Mm -hmm. So again, to go back to the case of the guy who was beheaded, they redid his, they did a postmodern uh, animation where he's joining Imam Hussein. Hmm. So he's, you know, embraced by, I think, a, yeah, so a beheaded. Anyway, uh, the point is that it's de the Shia thing is that, I mean, the name of the account, one of the accounts are, are the defenders of the, of the, of the shrine. Mm -hmm. And so it's a Shia shrine. There's definitely that, that messaging. Um, and, uh, and that's why it parallels also, I think, the Iran-Iraq war stuff. Mm -hmm. But I don't see it in the Yemen case at all. At all. When you said a parallel with Iran Iraq, I was surprised you said Iraqis were active in Lebanon and then with Palestinians. So, did I misunderstand you? Um, I'm not sure what you're say that again. You're saying that they made these parallels and they would say, um, okay, look, look um, in Yemen the Saudis have four people themselves. Yes, yes. But the Saudis oh, are, yes. you know, we're doing this, but in the time of Iraq. He was financing Palestinians, no argument with that, but what was he doing in Lebanon? Oh, no, so the Iranians, like one of the um, long, uh, long-standing long arguments against the Iranian state is the way that it's been funding Palestinians for years. Oh, even in Lebanon? Yes, in oh. Lebanon and in Palestine, okay, and, and, um, and also just funding Hezbollah. Yeah, because I was thinking Iran was uh, the one playing in Lebanon, right? Yes, they all, everybody had a hand in uh, oh, so that. <laughs> yeah, um, he was a big champion of, of Palestinians as well. That's but why. Not, but not Hezbollah, right? I know. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah. yeah, so I was just saying that they're, they're kind of taking an argument that's used against them and using it against Saudi Arabia. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So. <laughs> Any others? Well, thank you both. I think this was a fascinating discussion, thank and you. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.